Hello, and thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, my name's Adam Turnbull, and in this webinar, I'm going to talk about how we get data out of databases in real time. Um, we'll be taking some questions at the end, or if you prefer, you can email them in to me. Okay, so as we all know, databases have been around forever. There are many, many implementations and access to them has been standardized for a long time. So namely, we can use SQL to insert and query data. And this is mapped into programming languages by technologies such as ODBC and JDBC. However, the first problem when trying to get data in real time is that access is very much biased towards the world of polling. You compose a query, execute it on the database server, and wait for the results. This means that if we want data quickly, we have to continually execute our queries to see if there's a change that we might be interested in. That brings us to the second problem. Between one query and the next, how do we know what has changed? That is, how do we detect that data in one or more of the columns has changed? How do we know that a row has been added or a row has been removed? Historically, there've been a handful of solutions, but they've all got their own drawbacks. These are the points we're gonna cover during this session. We'll start with what seems like a simple but flawed approach and explore increasingly sophisticated ways to get data from a database. By the end, we'll have an elegant solution and we'll talk about how we can then represent the data in diffusion. A naive approach is to periodically poll a table and compare it with known state. The first problem with this is that you have to have a copy of the state in whatever's doing the polling, so you have something to compare with. Actually, it's not an unworkable solution in Diffusion, because if you keep an, if you update a Diffusion topic with the same data that it already has, there are no updates to send to clients. So from that perspective, it works. However, it does involve a full table scan and transfer of the entire table contents to Diffusion in each poll cycle. So it's very inefficient at the back end and maybe too slow to be workable, unless you have a relatively small number of tables with a small amount of data. Another approach could be to have a flag on each table to say whether it has been scanned or not. But this would mean that you can select only new roles and, and, and you change the flag once it's been read and processed. And the complexity is partially moved to the table update, which now needs to set the flag for each operation. In this example, you could miss updates if more than one happens during a poll cycle, and it doesn't cater for deleted rows at all. Database triggers can get us into a position where we can detect changes to tables as they happen rather than having to pull for them. Most databases have support for triggers, though the SQL to create them does vary between vendors. An example like this would run some trigger code when the new row is inserted into the accounts table. We could also have triggers for updates and deletions. Normally the trigger would also give us the before and after state of the data in the row too. So what can we do in the trigger? A common approach in the past has been to use a shadow table, which is a table with the same or very similar structure to the table that is being monitored, but with a couple of additional fields. Here, our shadow table is a copy of the account table, but has a new operation column that records what happened to the table, i.e. was there an insertion, update, or deletion? We also record the time that it happened, which, is a, which allows us to process multiple operations on the same row. Now we have a shadow table, we can pull for data in that instead of the source table and delete it once it's been processed. Unfortunately, even though there's likely to be much less data for us to pull for because we're not doing that full table scan, we're still polling. And we have to convince the DBA to allow us to create these triggers and shadow tables. And we also need to be really sure that our triggers work else they may prevent the database updates to the source table from happening. What would be great would be the ability to sidestep all of the shadow tables and send data directly from the trigger. Some databases, but not all unfortunately, allow us to do this. Oracle, for example, lets you write stored procedures that call to Java methods, and you can use those procedures with triggers. MySQL is trickier in that it doesn't natively allow Java, but you can write custom C and C++ functions that can be used in triggers. While this approach isn't portable, it does get us to the point where we can be notified of table changes when they happen and handle them in our code, including sending information out of the database. So let's say you've managed to create a trigger that calls your own code. You can create a connection to some external application that you need to send the data to. Now, 
how do you manage the case when the connection is lost? Can you buffer the table updates until you reestablish the connection? And if a transaction updates a thousand rows or a million, can, you, can your trigger handle this without blocking the database? And how do you install and maintain the libraries and triggers on the database? There's a lot of complexity here. So let's have a look at a third way of accessing the table data and track operations on it. Databases typically record changes in transaction logs, sometimes called a journal or binary logs amongst other names. This is an audit trail of what has happened in the database and generally used by the database to provide transaction support and recovery capabilities. And because it's an audit trail, we have a natural buffer of operations on the database. If we were able to read these logs, we'd have another way to detect changes without having to mess about with triggers. Unfortunately, the implementation and means of accessing transaction logs are highly specific to each database vendor and not guaranteed to be well documented or have the same implementation between different releases. This is where the Debezium project comes in. It's a third party open source library that can connect to databases, read their transaction logs and expose them using a standard Java API. An application using the Debezium library makes a connection to a database and registers an interest in tables it wants to capture change, uh, it wants to capture change events on, which superfic superficially sounds a lot like triggers. One great thing about this is that it works against many types of database, but you don't have to get involved in the high maintenance plumbing and it's very easy to use. It's, it's the best option I've come across, but it does have a few little limitations for example, it doesn't work with every database that's out there, but fortunately it covers the most common ones. So it covers Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, MySQL, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, plus a couple of others, and more over time as new releases come out. Um, you can also only monitor tables, so there's no support for views or the ability to run arbitrary SQL queries. And finally, and this is a problem anytime you need to modify a database, your DBA might have to enable access to the transaction logging. Diffusion um, has a new CDC adapter, which uses the, DB, uh, the Debezium library to provide near real-time access to database change events. So CDC means change data capture. It's capturing changes to database tables, including inserts, updates, deletes, and even changes to, to table schemas. The adapter is provided in the adapters, uh, adapter CDC folder of a Diffusion installation and consists of an executable jar file which takes a configuration file as a parameter on the command line. And the intention is that you would run this in the same way as any other adapter or control client. But it's also one of the first adapters in the Diffusion Gateway Framework, which means you can manage and monitor it from the Diffusion Management Console. Um, before showing you how the CDC adapter is configured, let's see it in action. Um, in the right-hand window here, um, I'm connected to a database and looking at a simple table. All of the rows have been created as diffusion topics, which I've subscribed to in the management console. And as I change data in the table, the topics are immediately changed. I hope you can see this. Um, this extends to removing rows from the table. So the topics are also removed and adding new table rows causes new topics to be created. Running the adapter is as simple as running a Java application, such as a control client. It takes, as I said before, it takes the name of a configuration file on the command line, and we'll discuss that in a moment. As previously, previously mentioned as well, the CDC adapter can be monitored and controlled, but not yet started or configured from, uh, and this is all, all could all be done from Diffusion Management Console. Um, here we can see an adapter registered and running and we can inspect its configuration plus perform some operations such as shutting it down or pausing and resuming it. The aim is to be able to start adapters through this interface and that's scheduled for a future release of Diffusion. The configuration file for the adapter is in JSON format. Um, we provide a JSON schema file if you need to validate that your configuration file is correct before attempting to use it. And the schema file also contains short descriptions of all the adapter's configuration parameters. 
It doesn't contain details about any Debezium specific parameters, and those can be found in the Debezium documentation. Um, but we, and we'll see an example of that on the next slide. Um, the config is divided more or less into three sections. And the first will show uh, you how to connect to the diffusion server, or that's how you define that connection. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's largely the parameters that you'd use when connecting with one of our SDKs, but in JSON form. Next section tells the adapter how to connect to the database rather than diffusion. Most of the time, we can take the easy route and copy these values from samples in the Debezium docs. Note that it references Java classes in here to provide access to specific databases. We package up the libraries for MySQL and PostgreSQL in the jar file for the adapter. But for the databases, you'll have to add them to your class path before starting, um, starting the adapter up. Um, on the previous slide, I mentioned that you can add other parameters which are documented by Debezium. In the example here, um, I've added a decimal.handling.mode with a value string. Without that, the JSON data that I would receive out of the adapter would be in an encoded decimal format that I'd have to serialize into an appropriate object. By doing this, I'm asking for it to be produced as a string, which is easier for me to deal with downstream. The next section declares which tables we want to get from the database and how to map them into diffusion topics. We can repeat this section if we want to map different tables in different ways as well. While our primary purpose is getting the data from the tables, we can also fetch the schema for the tables too by setting the include schema parameter to, tr to true. And when we do this, a separate topic is created for holding that. And as well as the changes to the data, we can ask the current for the current table contents when the adapter starts up, which means that we have the op option of having full state and, and subsequent changes or just the changes if we want. And if you want to go full event driven and don't care about history, you could set up the, uh, you can set the diffusion topic property for don't retain value and the changes are passed through from the database to your application without being stored in diffusion. And as I hope you can see, you, you've got lots of flexibility here and you can choose whether to use diffusion as a stateful reflection of the database, which is a very common use case, or as a simple event messaging system and just send the changes through. Um, speaking of state, you can ask the adapter to use time series topics in diffusion. So you can have your own audit log of changes to tables. In fact, you can use any options that you would normally use when creating topics. And the captured changes apply to both the table data and the table schemas. So both of those are captured. If someone modifies the table, that can also be captured. Okay, so that's because that's part of the table schema. Um, we haven't yet gone on to what the topic tree or topic contents will look like. So let's have a look at the main parameters for controlling that. So in the previous section, there's a parameter in the configuration called topic mapping, and it can be set to one of four values. Before we start, uh, remember that I said that the CDC adapter creates JSON topics. So it's safe to assume that's what we'll be working with. And the first we'll look at is array. So this is an obvious way to map a table to JSON, with each row in the table being a JSON object whose property names match the column names. And while this could create a large topic for the client to subscribe to, remember that they would only receive it all once on the first subscription. Any row that changes in the table maps really well to Diffusion's deltas. So after that, it's just the bytes that have changed, not even the row that's transmitted. Uh, which makes it really cheap for clients to stay synchronized with the database. The next is object, which is somewhat similar to array, but gives us a JSON object in the topic. The property names are the same as the primary key name, which makes it easy to reference each object on the client side. Um, but incidentally, if you'd rather the property names came from another column, such as in this example, the holder name, you can do that in the configuration file with the message.key.columns parameter. Um, you might be thinking that you can use topic views to expand out a topic like this and get the same effect. Um, or 
and 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 get multiple topics instead of just one big topic or you could do the same with uh, it'd be the same with an array of topics uh, and you'd be right but um, if you know that you want to expand them, everything out ahead of time there's another topic mapping type that will do all of that all of that for you without you needing to use topic views and that is the row mapping so each row in the table is mapped to its own topic um, again it's using the primary key as the topic name but again, you can override this with a message.key.columns parameter. And finally, there's a mapping called NOM, and that gives you the raw information that Debezium provides. The topic tree that it creates is similar to row, to the um, row mapping type, but there's far more detail, um, including additional schema information and the before and after values for any changed rows. For most use cases, I think this is probably too much information. But if you do need this level of detail, then it's available to you. OK, so, so that concludes a brief tour of the CDC adapter. So I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Again, you can email in if you prefer. If we can't answer anything immediately, we'll take a note of that and we'll get back to you later. OK, I don't think there is anything. So if um, anything does cross your mind, um, then please do email in and we'll do our very best to answer it. But thank you for listening tonight and have a good weekend and a good Christmas holidays. Thank you very much. <laughs>